Today, we are going to be switching things up and jumping into some 80s love ballad stuff. Specifically, we're going to be looking at Out of Time by The Weeknd from his album Dawn FM. This track was super fun to make, a lot of interesting layers happening here, a lot of cheesy 80s synthy goodness. But before we jump into any of it, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I work as a producer under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how they can work on their own productions at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you jive with the style that I do and you think we would have fun working on a project, check out the top link in the description. And now onto the video. So the main thing we're going to be talking about today are all of the synth layers happening here because I feel like this track is a really great example of picking synthesizers based off of the characteristics that they have. And it's almost like each individual synth part is an example of how you can use these sort of vintage style synthesizers in a track. I had to make some modifications to them, but let's just go through them. So the first guy we're going to look at is this lead line. It's interesting from a songwriting perspective how all of these layers seem very busy, but they find the perfect layer of mixing them a certain amount, making sure they don't step on top of the vocal. So even though you have this crazy, what I would call a lead, like a synth lead happening on top of the vocal, it doesn't really step on top of it, but that's because it's mainly following the notes that the vocal is singing. Oh, I'm there for you. Like the main notes of the melody are there in this this lead line, which means that they can both kind of coexist. This patch is using a Jupiter, which is based off of the Roland Jupiter. I was messing around with some of the presets and I found a bass preset that kind of had the filtery envelope thing that I was looking for. And so I just played it in a higher octave, which is something you can do just because a patch says that it's made for a bass or for a lead line doesn't mean you can't use it for either, although you might have to tweak it. But yeah, Jupiters in terms of vintage synthesizers are known for being like really thin thick analog synthesizers. Like this is used for a lot of classic 80s basses and they take up a lot of space in the mix. And the band Chromio has actually talked about in interviews how you actually kind of want to be careful about where you're using a Jupiter in your track because it can completely dominate all the mid range and low end. So I would say if you're going to use a Jupiter, try to limit it to like one or two tracks because it can really easily overtake an entire track. But yeah, I just wanted to accentuate that envelope a little bit. So I just used the auto filter in Ableton and then EQ'd it a bit again shaping out a lot of the frequencies that I don't really need from it musically. Underneath that, we have these guys, which is a synth brass patch from a Prophet style synth. The main way you want to get this sound is through this guy. You want to go to the filter section and make sure that the filter attack is really slow. That's how you get that sort of like rolling brass sound. And real quick lesson for anybody who's new to synthesizers, the filter attack is not the same as the amplifier attack. The attack itself is going to control how hard the synth is going to hit. So if I turn both of the attacks down, but I wanted to roll into it a little bit more, so I'm gonna adjust the attack on the amplifier. So now, you can hear it sort of, it sort of rolls into the note instead of that hard picky attack that it had before. But I wanted more of that like rolling flute sound. And so since we have like a low pass filter here, we can control that and make it so that it will sort of roll up. That's the main characteristic you want from this sort of like 80s brass sound. So now you know. Also, I duplicated this synth patch here and transposed the MIDI an octave down and then I band passed it because I really just wanted that sort of like lower beefier mid range. They're playing the exact same MIDI, but I just wanted to blend that underneath it makes it a little bit warmer. Also, another thing from a songwriting standpoint, we have a Prophet, which is another very thick multiple oscillator synthesizer playing really fat chords, and that could be a danger of it swallowing up everything in the mix. But the way that they get around it is it's only having it play on the vocal hits, on the out of time. And they have some gang vocals coming in there anyway, so that just sort of makes it lift up a little bit more. So again, when we're using these like really thick synthesizers we're being intentional about how we're using them and making sure that one patch is not completely swallowing the mix. Next patch I think we should look at are the keys. <laughs> 
In terms of vintage synths, we're using a DX7, which is based off of the Yamaha DX7. This is sort of like the go-to for like that cheesy, glassy, bell, 80s piano sound, even though there's like a lot of like really good like 90s stuff in here. This sort of like frequency modulation patch. It's just a classic. But then I felt like that didn't really have the beef that the original keys had in the original track. So what I did was I duplicated the MIDI and I brought in this sort of electric piano underneath it. Threw a little bit of course on it just to make it not like a straight keyboard. I wanted it to feel like sort of a, a mid-range layer underneath that other keyboard. And when we blend the two together, And see, these synths are holding out those chords and they're playing the whole time, but a majority of the sound is this DX7, which is a very thin sounding piano track. So it's not really in danger of stepping on anything's toes, especially since it's not really playing anything complex. And then I think the last synth layer that we're gonna look at is this guy. Which I'm just gonna say up front, I don't think they used a Mellotron for this track, but there was this like flute sound that's sort of like a call and response thing happening throughout the track in the chorus and the intro. And I couldn't really find any patches I was happy with in the sort of analog synth world that were giving me that sort of like fluttery flute vibe. And so I just reached for something that was the closest thing I could think of, which is a Mellotron. This thing is actually awesome. It was essentially the first ever like, like analog sampler. The Beatles used it, the Beach Boys used it a lot. And every single one of these notes has a long strip of tape, which is like a recording of a flute. And each one of these keys has a different recording of that flute on a different note. And so when you press down on a real one of these in real life, this drum is actually spinning a physical piece of tape that the key is activating. It has a very warbly lo-fi vibe to it. I, I genuinely love this instrument. I use it way too often. But yeah, I just did some very light mixing to make it fit with the rest of everything else. Some chorus, some H delay. I kind of hid behind the fact that I did really pick the right patch using some Valhalla Vintage Verb, which is not how I would recommend getting around this normally. It was just my way of sort of getting around the fact that I couldn't really find the patch that I was looking for. But yeah, if we just take all of these synth layers together, they sound like this. You can see that they're kind of swimming around each other, which is a great way to have all this sort of intricate sound design and all these different little synth layers. And they're all very distinct textures that you can pick out if you're listening for them. Like they're not blending into each other that much. And then we have this guy which is just a strat on one of the in-between positions. I believe this was in between the middle and the bridge pickup, which is the pickup selection on a strat you want to use if you want to get that sort of funk sound. Use this guy. I think by default, it has a drive pedal turned on, but I think I turned it off. And then, yeah, just did some general mixing. One thing I did do here is it was a little ice picky on the top end. So I just got this dynamic band in Pro Q3. <laughs> just to like keep it from being overbearing. And then we got to have a lot of fun with the bass on this guy. It's not the exact same bass line as the original song, but I got close enough. Basically, if you're trying to write funk bass lines, I already talked about it in my previous video, but you want to make sure that you're hitting the actual chord changes that you need to be hitting and then use the sort of riffing or the exciting sounding parts of a bass line as a way to transition between those chord hits. And when you're doing disco stuff like this, everybody loves octaves and fifths. Like this bass line sounds way more impressive than it actually is. It's actually pretty easy to play. Basically like root the octave up up, root the octave up, root the octave up. And then a little bit of a riff, that out, which starts on the same note that I was just at. So you can get a really funky sounding bass line by just making it simple. But yeah, I used a gate here just to clean it up a little bit. Normally I like going through and editing it real tight, but in the spirit of the 80s, I wanted to do it a little bit more like how they would probably do it. And in the 80s, you couldn't just go in and edit stuff like this. Like maybe late 80s you could, but like early 80s, late 70s, you would have just had to throw a gate on it and hope for the best. But yeah, I'm using the wide bass preset in Corey Wong archetype. Um, his bass 
base presets in here are very practical and I love them. Tweaked this scoop preset a lot just to try to t shape the tone a little bit. Like you can hear how much it's doing here. With it off. With it on. It, like it adds the grit, it adds the compression. It's a really fast way to tone shape stuff. And then here I did some mirror EQ with the kick drums. Basically what I did was I went to the kick drum, added Pro Q, and something that's cool that you can do in Pro Q is if you hit play and you hover your mouse over the waveform right here, it will show you where the sound is generally peaking. And then you can just grab this point here and it will turn it into a, an EQ point that you can change. So this sort of 78, 80 hertz, that's where the fundamental of my kick drum was and so what i did was i went to the bass subtracted that frequency range from it and then boosted a little bit above it to make up for that cut and then i just did the inverse on the kick which is a really great way to get your bass and your kick to sort of sit well together added a little bit of glue compressor just to sort of round it out a bit this is honestly a really nice compressor and i'm, I'm completely blown away that it's just something that's included for free in ableton i really like the soft clipping mode on it and then after all that compression and frequency stuff and everything sounding exactly Exactly how I want it to sound. I threw C4 on this just at the tail end so that any inconsistencies between notes or any aggressive points of picking during the performance, it's all leveled out. So. So like you can see when I'm picking, not all of my picks are consistent. And since I'm putting this at the end of the chain, it still gets all of the, the real nice nitty gritty parts of a performance of it going through the chain. It's just from a frequency standpoint, it's all leveled out here and more consistent. <laughs> And then I think the last thing that we are going to go through are the drums. So we're starting out with this Leno snare as sort of a clap into it which is a great way to get into any kind of disco fill. Just a very simple, like a white noise clap. It's literally just says disco. So good luck finding that sample. For the kick, I'm using the Kick Tape Smith. And then like I said, we're doing that sort of EQ shaping with it for the bass. For kicks, I like using the sampler because I can normally tweak stuff the way I want to. But what I've liked doing with snares is sort of manually dragging the audio onto the grid so you can control exactly how off of the one it is. So like this is the downbeat here and I didn't really do it with this beat but sometimes I like grabbing them especially if it's like a clap sample where you want it to be a little bit looser you can just sort of grab it like this and sort of make it blur over the line which can sometimes be a cool vibe didn't do that for here but just thought I would explain why sometimes my snares are in a drum rack and sometimes they're not but yeah this is the Leno fat snare <laughs> This sample was a little bit woofy, so I threw Moti T on it. Pretty heavy to bring some excitement, but then also really got rid of a bunch of the lows because there was a bit more than I thought there needed to be. And then there's this spring percussion loop which is underneath every other hit, which can kind of keep a, a disco beat more interesting without necessarily changing what you're playing. And then just a regular hi-hat loop. And the whole drum bus is going into a Shep's Omni channel. That's just kind of generally shaping everything but yeah that's everything so uh let's look at what the final beat sounds like But yeah, that's what the beat sounds like. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe and all the bell icons and all that stuff below. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday. So if you enjoy this kind of content, I'd really appreciate it. Over here is a video that YouTube thinks that you would enjoy from me. But yeah, other than that, I don't really have anything else. So I will see you guys next week.